Who would have ever thought that one of the most lovable parts about Godzilla vs Kong wasn't just another monster fight, but Kong and a little girl named Gia. The giant ape and the small iwi girl were easily the best dynamic duo in the film, and when they were both together on screen, they really did steal the show. But what if I told you that how these two unlikely friends met was not a story for the faint-hearted? In the Godzilla vs Kong novel, we got to experience the destruction of Skull Island's natural environment, and how the villagers of the Iwi tribe were almost entirely wiped out. All but a little girl. In this video, I'm going to read that segment from the novel so you get to know all the juicy information and heartbreaking visuals that the words place into your mind. Gia needed to be saved. Her village and family are gone, as Skull Island fell apart around her due to the storms around the island growing more powerful and more massive, the only thing that could save her was Kong. Let's get to it. Before we get to the story of how Gia met Kong, I want to focus on the significance of Gia as a character in a giant monster movie. How many times have you remembered a human character in a monster movie really getting that much attention in a good way from moviegoers and fans? There have been a select few human characters to reach this level of attention in a monster flick, but it really doesn't happen very often in the grand scheme of things. Gia though, she can certainly be put into number one for child characters to ever be in a monster movie as far as I'm concerned. The actress's performance was spot on and felt so natural, especially considering she is really deaf, which certainly helped her acting on screen come across as real. And it wasn't just her handicap that made her stand out. She was brave, humble, witty, and mature for her age. She has seen real bad things happen in her short life, so it has hardened her into being a person well above her years. This horrible experience she had will be told to you now. Perhaps because the Iwi tradition was so ancient, they were slow to react. Many of her kin were already gone, buried beneath a mudslide. The village of her birth was now sunken beneath roiling waters. The ancient wall that kept out the predators was filled with debris and became a dam holding the waters in as they had once kept the enemies out. And now she and a handful of her kin were fleeing towards the high grounds of hanging fish calls. There, where some said the caves could offer them shelter, shallow as they were, with no deep trails to the below, the land and its dangerous inhabitants. Now the water was to her knees, and she did not yet see the skyward yearning earth that led up to the high country. They were still among the ferns and rushes and make of fish trees that formed intertwined thickets too dense to travel through. She felt her own heart beating quick like a bee. She felt the pulse of sister mother's fear in her fingers and she felt something else in the water. She stopped, squeezing Sister Mother's hand, then pointing behind them where a cluster of trees and bushes drifted in the rising waters. Koro lifted his spear and heel too, but they might as well have been wielding twigs. The huge jaws opened, filled with teeth. The siren jaw clamped down, and now they were four fingers of kin rather than a handful in one. Sister Mother lifted her body and began to run through the water as best she could. Without her feet in the water, Gia could no longer tell what was happening behind her. She tried to look over Sister Mother's shoulder, but the rain was now so hard it felt like a shower of stones, and it was cold. Gia began to shiver. She felt Sister Mother's breath. So hard it felt like something tearing inside of her, and she squirmed trying to get down. Finally, Sister Mother did put her down, and to her surprise, she felt not water, but soil beneath her feet. It was wet with rain but she smelled moss now, and the rain bruised leaves of the needle leaf, which only grew on high ground. She looked up at Sister Mother, who flashed her a smile that wasn't really a smile, but Gia smiled back, a sign of her trust. There was no one else behind them, Gia saw, two fingers of kin now. She felt another turning in the earth below her, a trembling, growing stronger, nearer. Sister Mother knew it too. She could probably feel it in the air, with her ears as Gia could not. Once again, she grabbed her hand, pulling her along, no longer running uphill but parallel to the gradual slope. And then suddenly, in a moment, Sister Mother grabbed Gia around the waist and lifted her up, pushing her into the closely spaced sturdy limbs of a friend tree. Confused, Gia looked down at her, saw the smile that wasn't a smile, the farewell in Sister Mother's eyes. Then a wave of water swept down from the high ground and took her away. 
Gia glimpsed her hand reaching for a branch, then nothing. The tree shook despite its thick trunk and deep roots. Panting, her mind bright with fear, Gia climbed up this branch to the next. But the water was still coming for her. Too soon, she reached the most slender upper branches of the tree, which bent beneath her weight. She realized she was staring at her knuckles, pale from her death grip on the tree, as the water rising up the trunk from below and at nothing else. How tiny her world had become. So she turned her gaze out and was astonished. The black clouds piled against the mountains, full of light, glowing red and purple with inner fire. The water cascading down from the hills, the birth of a new river, however short its life might be. The trees all bent one way, as if bowing in worship to an unseen spirit in the deep distance. The furious rush of the wind itself, it was terrible and frightening and beautiful. That was everything about her home at once. There was no mercy in the water, the winds, the clouds, but there was no hatred either, no animosity. The tree shook in a way it had not before. Not from the wind, not from the rising water, but from something else. Something familiar, comforting, but at the same time so much bigger than her. As the water touched her feet, she saw him, in the distance coming her way. She waved, shook the branches of the tree, watching as he waded through the flood. He did not see her, she knew, she was so tiny. His head was almost in the clouds and his eyes were searching for something far distant like the bending trees. She closed her eyes, she knew the words to his hymns although she could not say them. In her mind they had their own shapes, taken from the lips of her kin, from their gestures, their expressions. She began to move her hands to make those shapes. Though you pass me by, O Kong, we are kin. Though you are great and I am small, we are one. Remember me, if only as a leaf fluttering in the wind. Then she felt a warm wind on her face and opened her eyes. He was there, his face filling her entire universe, his eyes almost as big as her, full of concern. Below her, his hand rose up until it was level with her, within her reach. He waited, it was her choice. And it was no choice at all. Her most ancient kinsman, her god, had come for her. What could she do but accept? She climbed into the huge cup of his hand. He closed it part way, shutting out the worst of the wind and the rain. And then, like a mountain walking, he started off. And Gio was relieved. She was sad, and she knew everything about her world was changed. And would never be the same again. Wow, <sighs> damn. Okay everyone, let's recap some of the big things here. Obvious being Skull Island's destruction. Remember how Ghidorah created the massive storms all across the planet? Well, for a time it seemed like nothing happened over Skull Island, but the truth came out that Monster Zero's storms combined with the natural storms around the island and made them much worse. The storms eventually consumed the island when mankind allowed Kamazots to be set free, using his dark powers to lure the storm in and around the island, covering it with a never-ending darkness. The Skull Island storms never end. Skull Island was flooded and all or most life on the island perished, including the Iwi people. Gia's sister mother, which really means that it could be either her sister or her mother or maybe even someone entirely different. Apparently in the Iwi culture everyone is a mother due to them all taking care of one another like a mother would. Regardless, this family member's death was extreme to say the least. Sacrificing herself to save Gia. All with no words and barely any emotions, just a smile that wasn't a smile. The Iwi really are a fascinating fictional people and I'd like to learn more about them. I wonder why Kong came to save Gia. Was he really able to understand her prayer that she did? I don't think he has any sort of mind powers, but something there does seem kind of odd. The island was falling apart everywhere, but he chose to save a tiny human girl. No one really knows why. But it was the start to this fantastic relationship between a girl and a king. Her stating that he was old kin of sorts to her also gives more clues that the Iwi originated out of the Hollow Earth just like the Kongs, almost like they evolved and grew as civilizations together as one. Thank you all for your time. If you think I earned it, stomp the subscribe button and share this video around with your monster-loving friends. This has been Jacob. I will see you in the next one.